It is good to be able to be with you again tonight. I hope you're all doing well and having a good week so far. If you have any updates to our prayer concerns, I hope you'll get in touch. I'll put the contact information on the screen in just a little bit. If you're joining us by phone, though, and don't have access to that, my number at the church is 224-0274, uh, 608-224-0274. I'd love to hear from you. If there's anything that we need to be praying about, get in touch. Uh, in our prayers, let's remember our Stuart, I believe, has his surgery coming up tomorrow. Also, Kenna has asked that we remember her family and the fires out in California. Her family isn't too far from what's going on out there. A uh, number of people she knows and loves are being affected by that right now, and so she's asking that we be praying for that situation. Tonight, we get back to our study of the book of Luke. By way of review, we know that Luke is a Gentile. He is a medical doctor. He writes both Luke and Acts to a man by the name of Theophilus. He's known for writing in chronological order. It is a well-researched account, as we might expect from a physician as he was. Uh, we also know that he, as a Gentile, includes a number of groups that were often overlooked by the Jewish people, starting with Gentiles, but also Samaritans, uh, women, widows, as well as the sick, and a number of others who were often overlooked or abused in the ancient world. Last week, we looked at Luke chapter 16. We had the parable of the dishonest manager. You may remember he was the financial guy who was fired by his master and then forgave a bunch of his master's debtors on his way out the door. And Jesus makes the point that we need to use our wealth strategically just as he did, not in a dishonest way, but rather in a strategic way to try to have a spiritual benefit to the money that we have. We had some warnings about the danger of wealth, and then we closed last week with the account, not the parable, but the account, I believe, of the rich man and Lazarus. Two men died. They went to two very different places. There was a huge uncrossable chasm or canyon between those two men, between the saved and the lost when this life is over. And we learn from that account that uh, we will be very much aware of ourselves when this life is over. We will not be sleeping in any sense of that term. We will recognize each other in the life to come. We will also be able to remember this life and we'll be able to remember our friends and loved ones when this life is over in the next life. Well, tonight we continue with Luke chapter 17, and I know we've been looking at the harmony of the Gospels throughout this study of Luke. Feel free to get that on Amazon. A Harmony of the Gospels by Robert Thomas and Stanley Gundry. It's between 23 to 25 bucks, give or take, on Amazon. It'll get to you in a couple of days. And we haven't really been using it over the last couple weeks because we've been in a section that's only found in Luke. And we're not going to be using it right now, but we will uh, just a little bit into, into tonight's class because we're going to skip over to John chapter 11 for a bit. Uh, but for tonight, we start with Luke chapter 17. So let's notice the first paragraph. Luke chapter 17, verses 1 through 5. Luke 17, 1 through 5. He said to his disciples, It is inevitable that stumbling blocks come, but woe to him through whom they come. It would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and he were thrown into the sea than that he would cause one of these little ones to stumble. Be on your guard. If your brother sins, rebuke him. And if he repents, forgive him. And if he sins against you seven times a day and returns to you seven times saying, I repent, forgive him. The apostles said to the Lord, increase our faith. Let's notice up in verse 1, Jesus starts by referring to stumbling blocks. I think we understand that literally a stumbling block is a block that we might stumble over. So very basic idea there. As parents, we think about tripping on Legos or toys or something left there in the middle of the night that we find in the dark by accident. Maybe we think about tripping over a crack in the sidewalk. Uh, I know out in the Pacific Northwest, visiting my sister a couple years ago, I realized that there is some moss so thick on some of the sidewalks that the moss is a tripping hazard. It rains so much out there. This moss grows on everything. But Jesus explains that stumbling blocks will come. All of us will trip over something. Tripping is always a possibility. However, Jesus says, woe to him through whom these stumbling blocks come. In other words, we as human beings will trip from time to time, 
But there are also situations when we as human beings might be the cause of somebody's stumbling. And so here Jesus is making the leap from a physical tripping hazard to a spiritual tripping hazard. And primarily, I'm thinking about our example here, the way that we live, maybe the things that we say, what we might do or say may cause somebody to trip and to fall spiritually. It's bad enough physically, but to cause somebody to trip uh, spiritually is so much worse than that. We may do or say something unkind. Uh, Maybe we're discovered to be a hypocrite in some way. Maybe we get in trouble with the law. Uh, any number of things that we might do to cause somebody to stumble spiritually. And certainly this is bad. But what's really bad is if we cause one of these little ones to stumble. And I'm thinking maybe Jesus is referring to actual children. That's an obvious possibility. He might be referring, though, to a new convert. Maybe somebody little in the Christian faith. Or maybe somebody who's just recently obeyed the gospel. But it seems the first and most obvious application would be to literal literal children. Uh, there's a special warning to those who may cause children to stumble, whether uh, metaphorically uh, or literally. And Jesus explains that the one who causes a little one to stumble, it would be better for him to have a millstone hung around his neck and to be thrown into the sea. A millstone, of course, is a large, heavy stone that was used to grind grain. It was often turned either by water uh, or by oxen or maybe even sometimes by people. It was a very large, round stone. So that it's a terrible picture, isn't it? To have a millstone tied around our neck and to be thrown into the depth of the sea. So a cruel picture. But instead of focusing on how cruel that is, We probably need to be focusing on how cruel it is to cause a little one to stumble because Jesus says that is worse. So we need to be on our guard that we are not the ones causing others to stumble, especially when it comes to children or maybe uh, those who are weak in their faith or new to the Christian faith. In verse 3, the conversation shifts. It changes just a little bit. Jesus gives another warning. If somebody sins against us, And if that person repents, we need to forgive. And sometimes it's easy for us to forget that middle step. Maybe you've heard people suggest that we need to just forgive everybody, no matter what. Forgive everybody, no matter what. Uh, But here Jesus puts a condition on it, doesn't he? Uh, The person repents. Repentance is a change of heart resulting in a change in the way that we live or behave. And so here, forgiveness is conditional upon repentance. At the same time, though, Jesus also recognizes the reality of human weakness. That is, even people who repent have a way of falling into sin again, don't they? And that applies to all of us. I know we're applying this to other people, but we might be the ones on the end of needing repentance here. We may not be the ones who are sinned against all the time. We may be the ones who are doing the sinning. Uh, But here we're talking about those who sin against us if they repent and coming back to us again and again and again. And when they sin against us and repent, our job is to forgive. Now, we're not bringing in everything that Jesus said on this subject, or we'd be here all night. He said a lot about repentance and forgiveness. But I would point out just briefly that in what is commonly referred to as the Lord's Prayer, even in this book, in Luke's account, back in Luke 11, you may remember Jesus told us to ask God for forgiveness And then he said, for we ourselves also forgive everyone who is indebted to us. And so just as we sin against God over and over again sometimes, so also people may do the same thing to us. And that shouldn't be too shocking to us. I know we don't want to forgive all the time. Sometimes it seems that there's a benefit for some reason for us to hold on to something or hold it over somebody's head. And they come to us with a change of heart asking us to forgive Even if it happens over and over again, our role is to forgive because sometimes we're in that same position before God. Sometimes we need forgiveness for the same thing over and over and over and over again. And as I see it, forgiveness here is the idea of releasing the sin or sending it away. We are no longer obsessing over this thing that somebody did to us. We aren't holding over somebody's head, this thing that they did to us, but it's not our problem anymore. We're we're letting it go. 
and we're letting God deal with that. Well, is this hard or is this easy? Is this difficult or is this an easy thing to do? Well, obviously, this can be incredibly difficult. It's hard to do. It's hard to forgive people when they sin against us. And so when they hear this, notice how the apostles respond. They don't just say, oh, okay, Lord, thanks for telling us. It's nice to know that. Now we can go out and forgive everybody who sins against us over and over and over again. They don't say that. But instead, they say to the Lord, increase our faith. In other words, they're asking for help. They know that this is not possible on their own power, but they're going to need some help with this. And that leads us to what comes next. So let's move on and notice that now Luke 17, verses 5 through 10, or rather 6 through 10. Chapter, or verse 5, I guess we might say, is kind of a transition between these two paragraphs. But let's go on with Luke 17, verses 6 through 10. And the Lord said, If you had faith like a mustard seed, you would say to this mulberry tree, Be uprooted and be planted in the sea, and it would obey you. Which of you, having a slave plowing or tending sheep, will say to him when he has come in from the field, Come immediately and sit down to eat? But will he not say to him, Prepare something for me to eat, and properly clothe yourself, and serve me while I eat and drink, and afterward you may eat and drink? He does not thank the slave because he did the things which were commanded, does he? So you too, when you do all the things which are commanded you, say, We are unworthy slaves. We have done only that which we ought to have done. So in response to the disciples asking for more faith, Notice that Jesus makes a comparison as he compares faith to a mustard seed. We've seen the mustard seed faith comparison before, but this is a little bit different as Jesus seems to think up something completely impossible, and that is commanding a mulberry tree to uproot itself and to throw itself into the sea. If you've had a mulberry tree, you might have had a little bit of frustration with it. They are messy trees, aren't they? If you've had one, you understand this. Uh, they mess up everything underneath them. They're a very messy tree. But uh, anyway, this impossible situation, commanding a tree to go jump in the sea. Well, that doesn't happen. That's truly impossible. But notice Jesus uses this to illustrate faith. With faith, we can do the impossible. But let's not miss the context. Let's not forget the context here. If God has commanded it, we can do it. Even if we think that it's impossible. So he's not saying that we can literally do anything that we can ever imagine, but in this context, we can do anything that God has commanded us to do. Remember, Jesus is saying this in response to the disciples thinking that it is impossible to forgive. He said, forgive over and over and over again. And they said, increase our faith. And so in response to that request, uh, this is his answer. If it is commanded by God, we can do it, regardless of how difficult we might think it to be. God does not ask us to do the impossible, but what he tells us to do, we can do, even though we might think it's hard. He continues with another comparison, and it seems pretty mean at first, doesn't it? Seems pretty cold-hearted here. But we need to realize in the second half of this paragraph Jesus is not telling us to treat people in this way, to be mean to our slaves, but he's saying this is the way it is. And so he's taking their attitude toward their own slaves or servants, and he's using that behavior to teach a lesson. We'll get back to the lesson in just a bit, but first the story. When your slave comes in from working hard all day, you don't tell him to throw his feet up and relax, do you? You don't tell them, hey, sit down for dinner. I know it's been a hard day. Just, just relax for a bit. We don't do that. But instead, when your slave comes in from working, you tell him to get busy with dinner. Come serve me dinner. And you certainly don't thank the slave for doing all that hard work because he's just doing what you told him to do. He is obeying you. And to us, that seems pretty harsh, doesn't it? We don't think in those terms. We don't treat people who serve us in that way. At least I hope we don't. But this is where Jesus flips it. We aren't really the master in this story. The original audience started out as the master in this story. But instead, Jesus flips it halfway through. We are the slave in this story. In verse 10, he says, so you too. So he's 
flipping this from the master to the slave. We're now the servant. So you too, when you do all the things which are commanded you, you say, we are unworthy slaves. We have done only that which we ought to have done. And so now we are the slaves in this picture. And so the question is, what in the world is this about? What is being commanded? What is the thing that we're commanded to do? Well, the command is not to work in the fields or fix somebody dinner. That's not what this is really about. The command is forgive people when they repent and when they ask for it. And so again, the whole point of the verse, first 10 verses is that we need to forgive. Yes, it's hard. Yes, it's difficult. It's uncomfortable. It's almost impossible from a purely human point of view. It's scary sometimes to forgive somebody for what they've done against us. But it is commanded. And if it is commanded, it is possible. And so we are to forgive by faith. And that's what this whole story is about. If God has commanded something, uh, we can obey him by faith. And we don't get some special reward for doing that. Um, that's just the minimum. This is what God has commanded us to do. And that's the picture of the master and the servant here. The servant just obeys, even though it's a difficult command. Now, if you're following along in the harmony of the Gospels, you'll notice we have some bonus material here. In chronological order, uh, John 11 gets inserted right here after uh, Luke chapter 17, verse 10. And basically, in John 11, we have the death and the resurrection of Lazarus. And we won't go into all of that, but we understand that Lazarus was sick. His sisters called for Jesus. Jesus came. He'd been dead four days by the time he gets there. He raises him from the dead, and then there's some controversy there, and that's all in John chapter 11. Uh, if you look toward the end of the harmony, um, a very valuable tool figuring out the timeline. There's a timeline on page 348. It's almost the last page in the whole book page 348 of the harmony you'll notice that this section still puts us in the winter of 2930 a.d so this is still we're just a few months out from the lord's crucifixion at this point so after john 11 gets inserted right here we now come back to luke chapter 17 so let's pick up again with luke 17 now we're in verses 11 through 19 luke chapter 17 verses 11 through 19 while he was on the way to Jerusalem, he was passing between Samaria and Galilee. As he entered a village, ten leprous men who stood at a distance met him, and they raised their voices, saying, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. When he saw them, he said to them, Go and show yourselves to the priests. And as they were going, they were cleansed. Now one of them, when he saw that he had been healed, turned back, glorifying God with a loud voice. And he fell on his face at his feet, giving thanks to him, and he was a Samaritan. Then Jesus answered and said, Were there not ten cleansed? But the nine, where are they? Was no one found who returned to give glory to God except this foreigner? And he said to him, Stand up and go. Your faith has made you well. This passage is one of two sermons that I preached over and over and over again in several different places as I was first thinking about going into preaching. Um, one summer we sent out letters to all the churches in the Chicago area and I preached on Zacchaeus. And that was the sermon I first preached over and over and over again all over the Chicago area, including uh, once in Janesville the last Sunday of that summer. This is one of my next sermons. Um, the healing of the ten men with leprosy. And so I preach this over and over again, probably the next summer. But this is uh, burned into my memory, this little paragraph. I've uh, preached this many times to many different groups, I guess we might say. Um, so if I had a chance to fill in early on, this is, this is one that I often came back to. Uh, but in this passage, notice Jesus is on his way to Jerusalem. And he's passing between Samaria and Galilee. So he's still pretty much up north at this point. And as he passes through one village, I would say um, that Jesus met 10 men with leprosy, but in this translation, at least, Luke says that they met him. And so it wasn't a matter of him meeting them. They were looking for Jesus. They knew that he was coming. And so as Jesus is passing through, uh, these men take the initiative. They stand at a distance. I want us to notice that. 
they are basically quarantining themselves, aren't they? They are social distancing 2,000 years ago. This was a requirement of God's law for those with diseases like leprosy. They had to keep their distance. You can read about this in Leviticus chapter 13, probably the next couple chapters as well. And so from a distance, they call out, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. And that right there is probably one of the best, one of the simplest, one of the most effective prayers that we could ever pray, isn't it? Wouldn't hurt to repeat that. Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. That's a prayer that we can often pray. Have mercy on us, Lord. Be merciful. Uh, when we don't know what to pray, asking God to have mercy on us is a pretty good prayer to pray. And so that's what they're calling out to Jesus. They, they had to raise their voices because they're so far away. Uh, this has been one of the challenges of the current pandemic, hasn't it? We are farther away from each other. Uh, we've got these plexiglass barriers between us and the person checking us out somewhere. We've got the masks on, our faces are covered, and so we've had to do more shouting over the past six months than normal. And that's what these men have to do. They raise their voices because they're at a distance from the Lord as the law had commanded. Well, as soon as Jesus sees these men, when he hears this request, he tells them to go and to show themselves to the priest. Again, under the law of Moses, the priests were the ones who were to uh, pronounce you clean from disease. They weren't really doctors. That wasn't their job. But they were the ones who could lift a quarantine. They were the ones who kind of knew everybody in the village. They were familiar with the circumstances. They knew the law. And it's interesting, of course, that Jesus never officially uh, heals them. There's no... Uh, be healed kind of moment. It just says, go, show yourselves to the priest. There's no hocus pocus, no big show here, nothing, uh, no proclamation, but simply a command to go and show themselves to the priest. Along the way, as they are going, they are cleansed. I think about the command for us to be baptized. It's in the process of obeying that command. As we are in the water, as we are buried as we are lifted out as that command is fulfilled is when our sins are forgiven and so in a similar way as they are going as they are obeying the lord here they're cleansed and they're healed and one of these men seeing this when he sees that he's healed seeing his skin restored we don't even have time to talk about leprosy we understand it was just a serious skin disease losing fingers and toes, losing feeling in the extremities and, and progressing like that. As he sees his skin restored, he turns back, glorifying God with a loud voice. He falls on his face at Jesus' feet, giving thanks. Just a side note here in the form of a question. How often do we thank our doctors for helping us get well? And I, mean, I know it happens, but many times today healing takes time. And we aren't really with our doctors when we start feeling better. The doctor might write a prescription. Uh, we stop by the pharmacy. We fill it. We go home. We feel better in a few days. And we might not see the doctor again for a few months or maybe a year or more. And we're often somewhat distant from our doctors these days. But this man is somewhat distant from Jesus, isn't he, when he's healed? And so he turns back. He has to make some kind of an effort. Instead of going forward with the other nine to get cleared by the priest and back to their normal everyday living, this man sees what happens and he stops in his tracks. He does a U-turn. He turns back glorifying God. And he falls at Jesus' feet giving thanks. And in keeping with the theme in the book of Luke, we find that this one leper is a Samaritan. Remember, Luke doesn't need to mention this. Well, first of all, this account is only found in Luke, which is interesting. You know, Matthew, Mark, and John didn't, uh, didn't find it in their hearts to include this. They weren't inspired by the Spirit to include this. Uh, but Luke does. And notice he specifically points out that this man is a Samaritan. He could have left the ethnicity out of it, but he includes it here. Uh, to intentionally, I believe, include a group of people who are often excluded by most Jewish people. Luke, as a Gentile himself, writes to a Gentile, and so he praises a non-Jew to be inclusive to those who are not Jews reading this account for the first time. 
and how comforting that would be to see somebody like them in the gospel account. And he does that on purpose. In Luke 7, uh, verse, uh, let's see, verse 17 here, Jesus answers this man's thankfulness with a question. Where or were there not ten cleansed, but the nine, where are they? Was no one found who returned to give glory to God except this foreigner? So again, I hope we noticed that the first time reading this. Notice again the emphasis on foreigner. So Luke points out he's a Samaritan. Jesus emphasizes that he's a foreigner. So even at this time, Jesus notices that the Jewish men are not those who return. Only the foreigner comes back and worships. So several times now, Jesus has told parables about you know, the vineyard being taken away from the current occupants and given to others. And this is in keeping with that theme. The gospel is not limited to the Jewish people. And we see this very early on. Uh, at the end, Jesus tells the man to stand up and go. That his faith has made him well. It's interesting we don't see faith mentioned until the very end here. And it's interesting because faith was apparently a factor in this healing. How do we know that all ten men had faith? They observed Jesus' command and they obeyed it. And they went and they showed themselves to the priest. If they had not gone, if they had argued with Jesus about the cure, if they'd said, well, how am I going to show myself to the priest with my fingers missing? You know, if they had argued with Jesus like that, they wouldn't have been healed. But as it is, they took steps, literal steps, in the healing process. They were obedient. But there's a huge lesson here for us. Be thankful. Unfortunately, nine out of the ten were not thankful. And it's interesting that Jesus notices this. Uh, I sense some hurt feelings here. Maybe we wonder, can Jesus have hurt feelings? And I, I think maybe so. But I think we sense a reminder. Be thankful. When I first started researching this passage for today's lesson, I went back and looked at a sermon. Uh, the sermon I referred to earlier, back from 1991. And in that lesson, I shared a handwritten list of all the things that I was thankful for back then. And I have it right here. It's a list on some loose-leaf notebook paper. And in my note here, I took these notes during my Biology 2 class with Dr. Milton Tucker. This was a... Uh, Biology 1 was a study of botany. Biology 2 was a study of zoology uh, for my undergraduate degree. And so I don't know if he told us to do this in biology class or if I kind of wandered for a bit and started writing things down, but uh, just made a list of my blessings at that point in my life back in 1991. My health. Wow, that's interesting. You know, so many years ago to be thankful for health. And I'm still thankful for health today. Freed Hardeman University. Still thankful for Freed Hardeman. A church, friends, food. Oh, I was a college student. I was thankful for food, even thankful for the school cafeteria. Peace, shelter, water, clean water, warm water. I'm thankful for water, even today. I'm very thankful for warm water. I've mentioned that to some of you over and over uh, during our time here in Madison. I'm thankful for Dr. Tucker the teacher of this class. I can't remember if I just mentioned this, but he got his PhD at UW-Madison. So um, you knew, Dr. some of you knew Dr. Tucker before I did, and then I came to know and love him before I met any of you, which I find very interesting. We met him under different circumstances. Um, all other teachers, uh, Ralph Gilmore, Billy Smith, Earl Edwards, Richard, he was one of my roommates back then, and then a huge list of names, people I was thankful for at that point in my life. Um, the guys in Pharaoh. Pharaoh was my dorm back then. Uh, a number of other things were listed here. There's no Kaola on this list, by the way. Uh, this list was pre Kaola. This is before I met her. Of course, now I'm thankful for her as well. Um, but I would take this healing as a reminder to be thankful. If you have a chance, make a list and keep it and put a date on it and your circumstances at the time. Or maybe, as I mentioned before, as you walk or run or work out in some other way this week, use that as an opportunity to thank God the whole time. I've done that on walks and hikes myself. You can be specific and thank God for one thing after another, and I bet you can do it for an hour or so. I, I know I've done that in my life, and I bet you can as well. Just thanking God the whole time for various blessings that he's brought into our lives. And so let's be very thankful. Before we move on, I want to share a modern story of somebody being thankful. 
And this comes from right here in Madison. Back in December of 2011, Madison police were called to Willie Street for a report of, man, of a man throwing things out of his apartment onto Willie Street. And when police showed up, a, ba a man had barricaded himself in his apartment and police ended up shutting down Willie Street for several hours. You can imagine the chaos that that would have brought uh, before they finally took the man into custody. And, and it, you know, very dramatic. I'm sure it was on the news at that time. But about five weeks after that, one of the officers who was working that scene was volunteering at a community meal program in that area. And a man came up to the officer and apologized for his behavior and thanked the officers for how they treated him that day. And that was the man who five weeks earlier had shut down Willie Street because of that erratic behavior. And that man then gave the officer this painting that showed on the screen as a way of saying thanks to the police for treating him as they did and, and just thanking the whole department. And he asked that that painting be displayed somewhere where his thanks could be passed along and remembered. Uh, this painting is now displayed in the briefing room at police headquarters in downtown Madison, right next to a poster outlining the core values of the MPD. The first of which is this. We acknowledge the value of all people and carry out our duties with dignity, respect, and fairness to all. And under the painting is the man's name along with a short dedication. With thanks to the officers for saving my life. I doubt many officers here in Madison get a thank you from somebody after being arrested, but they did back in early 2012, and that's the story of this painting. Even in difficult circumstances, it is possible to be thankful, and I think we learn this from Luke chapter 17. Let's go on and let's notice Luke 17 verses 20 through 32. Luke 17, 20 through 32. Now, having been questioned by the Pharisees as to when the kingdom of God was coming, he answered them and said, The kingdom of God is not coming with signs to be observed. Nor will they say, Look, here it is, or there it is. For behold, the kingdom of God is in your midst. And he said to the disciples, The days will come when you will long to see one of the days of the Son of Man, and you will not see it. They will say to you, look there, look here, do not go away and do not run after them. For just like the lightning, when it flashes out of one part of the sky, shines to the other part of the sky, so will the Son of Man be in his day. But first he must suffer many things and be rejected by this generation. And just as it has happened in the days of Noah, so it will be also in the days of the Son of Man. They were eating, they were drinking, they were marrying, they were being given in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark, and the flood came and destroyed them all. It was the same as happened in the days of Lot. They were eating, they were drinking, they were buying, they were selling, they were planting, they were building. But on the day that Lot went out from Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. It will be just the same on the day that the Son of Man is revealed. On that day, the one who is on the housetop and whose goods are in the house must not go down to take them out. And likewise, the one who is in the field must not turn back. Remember Lot's wife. Up in verse 20, the Pharisees are asking Jesus about the timing of the coming of God's kingdom, which is interesting. Since the Pharisees are really only trying to trap Jesus at this point. Remember, we've seen that a number of times. So I'm assuming this is a trick question of some kind. They don't care. They're not really concerned about the coming of the kingdom. They don't care about that. They're just trying to get Jesus to say something that would get him in trouble in some way. And so in answering their question, Jesus gives something of a non-answer, if I, if I understand it correctly. If I could paraphrase, he's basically saying whenever the kingdom comes, you guys won't be seeing it. <laughs> you know, instead, the kingdom of God is in your midst. In other words, the signs of the kingdom are all around you. They are talking to the king of the kingdom. And they don't even get it. And they don't even recognize it. And so in terms of signs, 
you can't get much more of a sign than that. And so it's completely over their heads. In verse 22, Jesus shifts and he starts talking not to the Pharisees, but to the disciples. And to the disciples, he says that there's a time coming when they will long to see the days of the Son of Man, but they will not see it. As I understand this, Jesus is talking about his own second coming. In the fairly near future, his disciples will wish the Lord would return. They will wish it was his second coming, but it won't be it quite yet. In other words, his return will not be in their lifetime. And I think this is in keeping with some of the other passages, like the parable of the ten bridesmaids where the return of the groom is delayed. And, and this also tells us that there is a difference between the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD and the Lord's final return at the end of time. One would happen in their lifetime. Uh, that would be the destruction of Jerusalem. The other would take place at, at a time in the more distant future. And that's the second coming of Jesus that he's referring to here. As I understand it, this passage is about the second coming. Uh, even though some of the language is the same as what Jesus uses elsewhere to describe the destruction of Jerusalem. I know it can be confusing. Wayne Jackson has a good article on this that I'll try to post in, in the description of this video, uh, maybe in the comments under the uh, link to tonight's class in the Facebook group. But Brother Wayne has a good article that I'll try to share. In verse 23, we find there will be many deceivers, those will, uh, who will try to trick us into thinking that the Lord's return is imminent. But the truth is, nobody knows when the Lord will return. Unlike the destruction of Jerusalem, there are no signs leading up to it. That's another huge distinction between these two events. And, and nobody knows. It'll be a complete uh, surprise, very quick and decisive, like lightning in verse 24. It'll be quick, without warning. He then gives two examples, Noah and Lot. In the days of Noah, the flood came suddenly, without warning. Yes, Noah preached. But nobody knew when the rain would actually start falling. People were living their lives, eating, drinking, marrying, giving in marriage, until the day when Noah enters the ark and the flood begins. In the same way, the people in the days of Lot were eating, drinking, buying, selling, planting, building, until God suddenly and without warning rains fire and brimstone from heaven and destroys everybody in that area. In the same way, the Lord's return will also come suddenly, and it will be without warning. In verse 31, we find when he returns, there's nothing we can do about it. Remember, at the destruction of Jerusalem, he said, pay attention to the signs and get out of there. With the second coming, getting out of there will do no good. Uh, his return is not something we can run away from. I think of a plane crash. When the plane goes down, there's no time to get your carry-on. The, the flight attendants always say, just get up and go. There, there's no time. Just get out. There's no turning back. It's over. In verse 32, Jesus tells these people to remember Lot's wife. One of the shortest verses. Not the shortest, but it's up there among the shortest verses in the New Testament. Remember Lot's wife. Lot, of course, basically had to get dragged out of Sodom by the angels. And as they leave, his wife looks back and she's turned into a pillar of salt. And the lesson is, don't turn back. Her problem, I believe, is she wanted to go back. She missed those people. She missed her former way of life. She wanted, she was looking, she was looking longingly back at the place that uh, was being destroyed. She, she was missing her stuff. She was missing her friends. And so instead of looking forward and getting out of there, Lot's wife was a bit too connected with that old way of life. And so the reminder is, as we look forward to the Lord's return, let's not get too connected with this worldly way of living. Remember Lot's wife. And this lesson continues with the last few verses of this chapter. So this is the last paragraph here. Luke 17, verses 33 through 37. Luke 17, 33 through 37. Whoever seeks to keep his life will lose it, and whoever loses his life will preserve it. I tell you, on that night, there will be two in one bed. One will be taken, and the other will be left. There will be two women grinding at the same place. One will be taken and the other will be left. Two men will be in the field. One will be taken and the other will be left. And answering, they said to him, Where, Lord? And he said to them, Where the body is, there also the vultures will be gathered. As I understand this, Jesus is saying that as we get closer to his second coming, our goal is not to save our lives, but our goal is to give our lives away. And then he returns to emphasizing how quick and without warning his return will be. 
We see something similar to this back in Matthew, but on a different occasion, two people in bed where one's taken and the other is left, two women grinding, one is taken, the other is left. And then notice we have a verse in brackets, just by way of explanation here briefly. Some of you might not even have this verse in your text at all. It might uh, be in the footnotes, it might be here without an explanation. Basically, verse 36 is not found in some of the oldest manuscripts. The Bible, of course, uh, New Testament written in Greek. We don't have the originals. We have copies of copies, and sometimes copies of copies of copies of copies. We have close to 6,000, maybe more manuscripts at this point. We compare those, try to figure out the oldest ones, and we figure the oldest closest to the original is more accurate. They're all incredibly accurate. Uh, but if there's a slight difference in wording, we try to go to the oldest manuscripts. And so you might notice a note in the footnote here in verse 36 uh, that the comments in verse 36 are not found in the oldest manuscripts. And so I think when we kind of reconstruct how this might have happened, there's a pretty good chance that Jesus doesn't say this on this occasion, but he does over in Matthew 24, verse 40. And so there's a chance that as a scribe is copying this that he remembers what Jesus said from another passage and inserts it here. So Jesus did say this, uh, but there's a good chance Luke doesn't record it for us. So just wanted to explain the footnote there. hope that makes sense a little bit. And that's why we have the note, uh, early manuscripts do not contain this verse. But the thought in this passage is consistent. No doubt here about what he's teaching. The Lord's return will happen quickly and without warning. They want to know where this will happen. <laughs> <laughs> They're not concerned how to prepare for it. They want to know where. And, and Jesus gives a, a rather cryptic response. Where the body is, there also the vultures will be gathered. In other words, the place is not important. But it'll be a, death, a day of death and destruction for, for many, many people. Well, that brings us to the end of chapter 17. Thank you for being with us tonight, either online or on the phone. Be sure to send me any prayer requests, anything that we need to be praying about, so I can get those in the bulletin. And next week, let's all come prepared by reading Luke chapter 18. There's some great, great lessons in Luke chapter 18. And I hope you can come and be with us next Wednesday evening for that. Let's close by going to God in prayer. Our Father in heaven, like the apostles, we come to you tonight asking you to increase our faith. We're thankful for your word and we're thankful for the promises of a life to come after this one. As we live the Christian life here and now, we pray that we would not cause anyone to stumble with the things that we do or say or post online, but instead we ask that we might encourage each other as we do what we have been commanded to do. Tonight we're thankful for all that you have done for us. We're thankful for our many blessings, for our physical health, for our Christian family. We praise you that you have given us good things with plenty left over to share. We pray for greater faith as we prepare for the return of your son. We come to you with these requests, both thanking and praising you in the name of Jesus, your son, our Lord and our Savior. Amen.